Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eun Siu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. It is my great joy to welcome you to our worship service at the Vine, an online campus of Riceville United Methodist Church. We are truly grateful to have this opportunity to worship together. No matter where you are joining us from, we cherish your presence with us today. As we have embarked on a new season of the year, we have been exploring scripture, reflecting on the question, who am I? So our prayer is during today's worship service, you will experience a profound connection with God and uncover your identity in Christ. Now, let us open our hearts and mind before God. Take a deep breath and feel closer to our Lord. Let us go before God in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be shown on your screen. Creator God, you hear our wordless hopes, hold our greatest fears, and know our deepest shame. Nothing we say, do, or think surprises you, because you made us and know us more intimately than we know ourselves. As we seek to understand ourselves, give us courage, knowing that your love for us will never be called into question. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thy 
shore, dear Lord, to thy shore, just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Good morning. I'm Doug Lane, senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and it's my privilege to be able to bring the morning prayer. So if you will, please bow your head in prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, you have bound us together in this life. Give us grace to understand how our lives depend on the courage, the industry, the honesty, and the integrity of all those with whom we interact. May we be mindful of others' needs, including those that have been tasked to work with and help us at work, at school, at home, at the store, the restaurant, or even at church. Help us to see the good in every task and every person we meet. May our actions today bring glory to you and benefit to others. Help us to prioritize our tasks and give us the discipline to complete them. Let us be truly productive and not just busy. Bless our efforts and let them bear fruit. Where there are challenges, give us the strength to face them head on and the resilience to bounce back, bounce back from any setbacks. May we be steadfast and courageous, always aiming to do our best. And help us to remember that every challenge is an opportunity for growth. For those who we know who are suffering from challenges and setbacks right now, we ask that you will lift them up with hope and healing as that we name them out loud or in our hearts. Dear God, as we embark on this week's journey, help us to maintain a balanced approach to our tasks and responsibilities. Help us work diligently, but also grant us moments of rest and peace. We ask these things so that we can be our best for you and for those around us as we try to follow in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior, the same one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time in the service when we have the opportunity to give back to the Lord a portion of what we have received throughout uh, this week, this month, even this year. And so if you'd like to support the ministries here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, you can always send in a check to Wrightsville United Methodist Church, Post Office Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, zip code 28480. Or you can go on our website, rightsvilleumc.org, um, or you can use our, um, our phone app, and, uh, and you can uh, give that way. So uh, we certainly appreciate um, all of your gifts, and, um, and thank you so much for supporting the ministries here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Hey everybody, it's time for the children's sermon. So if there are any boys or girls around, I hope that they will come over toward the monitor or to the TV set and check out what I have to say. Everybody here? All right, great. What do I have with me today? Can anybody tell? I'll give you a hint. You can take these pieces out and put them back in. Yeah, it's a children's puzzle. And it has different animals on them. I would consider this a toy, but for somebody, it was work to create this. 
somebody had to carve out all these pieces and somebody had to color them and paint the backdrop. In fact, it says down here at the bottom that it was crafted by hand. So somebody put this together. It was somebody's job to make this puzzle. So what might seem like a toy to you and me was work for somebody else. Now, work is an important part of life. Now, some people will complain about certain aspects of their job. Not everybody likes everything that they do, but I hope that whoever made this puzzle feels really good about what they did because they were able to bring joy and happiness to little kids' lives by uh, creating this puzzle and teaching them about animals. So they were able to do something really, really neat. And that's what work is for. It's so that everybody can feel like they are contributing to all of society at large so that everybody um, can do their part to help make everybody feel um, like they're contributing, that they're doing something that's worthwhile for the rest, of, um, the rest of the world, the rest of their community, or maybe just their house. Um, for some people, it might be making puzzles. For other people, it might be uh, raising up boys and girls, parenting. Um, for some people, it might be being a school teacher and helping to teach. But everybody's got an opportunity to contribute in some way through what we call work. And so I want you to think about um, the things that, that you have in your life and how somebody created that and made that so that you might have it. And what has been good and brings us joy, uh, hope brings the person who made it joy too because um, their work was really, really helpful to us. All right, let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for your work in putting together the heavens and the earth and all that is in it. Lord, we thank you for giving us gifts and abilities where we can do work, whether that's through play or through study or through all kinds of different ways that we help each other. Lord, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here. And it is my great joy and privilege to get to bring you our scripture and our message today. We are still in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. And today we are reading from Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, and then verse 15. Hear now the word of God. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. On the sixth day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no vegetation of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and the water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, 
We, your people, are longing today to hear a word from you. God, I ask that in this time you would even use me to speak to your people. Lord, I pray that anything that I say that isn't from you, let it be instantly forgotten. But God, anything I say that is from you, let it sink and root deeply into our hearts. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. I don't know if you can relate to this, but I have those friends and sometimes even family members who, when we get together, we like to say that we're going to solve all of the world's problems. Well, that's definitely me and my two older sisters. I remember a time just two years ago when we were on our way to visit my grandparents and driving several hours, and we talked about everything there is to talk about. And one of those things was this particular tweet that one of us had seen, I can't even remember who it was, that said something along the lines of, it's crazy that we all could have just been hanging out and eating fruit, but instead we all have to go and contribute to the economy and have a job. I'm not saying it nearly as well as it was phrased in the tweet, and it was a lot funnier there, but I couldn't find it again. Anyway, my sisters and I had this long conversation about whether or not we thought that was true. It came as one of my sisters was struggling to find a job that really was meaningful to her. But I came from the perspective that I wasn't so sure that that was true based on the stories that we have in the Bible. I thought about this again as we are in the midst of this series called Who Am I? where we're thinking about what the stories of scripture can tell us about who we were designed to be and what will make our lives most fulfilling. Today, we're going to talk about the concept of work and the fact that actually work is central to the way that we were created. Now, I know this might sound crazy to you because there's a lot of myths that we have received about what work is and what its purpose is. So today we're gonna to talk through some of those myths and see how scripture shines light on this. Our first myth is this, that work is a necessary evil. In other words, we work because we need to do so to survive, but if we didn't need to, then we wouldn't work. You can even see this in the cultural idea of working really hard for 40 years and saving money so that you can finally retire and live the life that you've always dreamed of. But the reality grounded in scripture is that work is good. I'm gonna say that again. Work is good. The first instance of the word translated as work in the Bible is in Genesis 2-2, which says, On the sixth day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. God is the first worker. And the first work is creation. And God says over and over again, that this work is good. If God is a worker, then our work is one way that we show the image of God. Even beyond this, work for humans was designed not after the fall as a consequence, but before the fall. You can see this here in verse 15. It says, the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. As soon as we were created, we were given a job to do. Originally, as I started working on this sermon, I had intended to say something about the fact that God doesn't really need us to do work, that we don't need to have a job because of course God is sufficient and could make anything happen without us. But as I studied the text more closely, my thinking was challenged. Genesis 2-5 describes a moment 
when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no vegetation of the field had sprung up for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was no one to till the ground. This phrase, there was no one to till the ground is really interesting. The word that has been translated here very generally as no one is actually no Adam. You see, before Adam is a name, it's a descriptive word that means something more general, like human. It comes from the word Adama, which means earth. The Adam is the one who comes from the Adama. So more accurately, this phrase could be translated, there was no earthling to till the earth. The earth, as God designed it, can't flourish without an earthling to till it. This is less about what is possible and more about what's fitting. God could sustain the earth without humans, but in God's imagination, it is right that humans be involved. Our flourishing is bound up together, and that is clear in the very grammar of the passage. We see the same vision for humanity throughout scripture. We are called to be co-creators with God. The grace of creation isn't even just that we exist and more than that, that we're loved by God, but even that God wants us to participate in making the sort of world that God imagines. When we are actively engaged in helping to build this world, using the skills that have been given to us, we are imaging God in the world. Our work becomes a participation in God's work and God is glorified. So the first myth is that work is a necessary evil, but the truth is that work is good. The second myth we've been told is that work is what you are paid for. I bet that there's some of you who are listening today who don't believe that you are a worker. Maybe you think that work is what you used to do before you retired. Or maybe you think that work is what you did before you started staying home with your kids and changing diapers and cleaning up messes and cooking meals. This is because in our culture, we have tied work primarily to compensation. Work is what you get paid to do. And the quality and importance of your work is seen in how much money you're paid to do it. But God's definition of work is not tied to compensation. After all, the first reference to work in scripture is the work that God does. And God never got a paycheck. God's work is defined by God's satisfaction with it. God finds the work of creating the world to be fulfilling. At every interval of the creative process, God stops and says, this is good. Have you ever felt that feeling of finishing a task or creating something and thinking, this is good? It's likely that that thing for you that may be your work. Your work may or may not be the thing that you are compensated for. Because work is not about compensation. Instead, it is about contribution. Your work is the thing that you do that can bring meaning to your life and to the world. We can see this in the definition of the world that is used to describe our work in the first telling of our work. The word that is used to describe our work is tilling, and the Hebrew word is avad. 
This Hebrew word is also the same word that's used throughout the Old Testament to talk about serving. So when you avod something, you serve it. We can understand then that work is tied to our ability to serve others and to serve God's good world. While the myth tells us that work is what we're paid for, we can know that work is not about compensation, but about contribution. Now, I still imagine that some of you listening don't think that your work brings any real contribution, perhaps especially to the Christian life. I have to confess that I can understand why you've come to think this, because we in the church have failed to properly communicate the dignity of work and the importance of work that happens in the secular world. If you remember only one thing from this sermon, let it be this. Your work is no less holy than mine. I was recently listening to a podcast about faith and the workplace, and one of the hosts told a story about a man in his congregation who was a very successful builder. In fact, he had done such fabulous work both in his craft of building and with his business savvy that he had managed to turn this company that started just with him into the primary builder in the area. You couldn't go anywhere in the community without seeing something that had been built by his company. And his buildings were known for being strong, long-lasting, and beautiful. Well, when this man was talking to his pastor, he said, God has given me the ability to have this business success so that I can make money and give it to the church so that people like you can do the real work of the kingdom. Now, the pastor was, of course, incredibly grateful for these financial contributions that the man was making. And he was so glad that he could understand his role in contributing to the mission of the church. But at the same time, the pastor was heartbroken that the man thought that the work that he did only had value and only related to the kingdom of God as much as it provided financially for church work. See, the pastor could see the intrinsic value of the work that this man had done, the way that he had provided space for so many to have shelter and beautiful places to live. One of my favorite thought leaders in this area is the writer Dorothy Sayers, who was a novelist in the first half of the 20th century. In addition to her novel writing, she also wrote um, a lot about the concept of work from her perspective as a very committed Christian. Here's one of my favorite passages that she wrote. She says this, let the church remember this, that every maker and worker is called to serve God in his profession or trade, not outside of it. The apostles complained rightly when they said it was not meant they should leave the word of God and serve tables. Their vocation was to preach the word. But the person whose vocation it is to prepare the meals beautifully might with equal justice protest, it is not meant for us to leave the service of our tables to preach the word. The official church wastes time and energy and moreover commits sacrilege in demanding that secular workers should neglect their proper vocation in order to do Christian work, by which she means ecclesiastical work. The only Christian work is good work well done. Let the church see to it that the workers are Christian people and do their work well as to God. Then all the work will be Christian work, whether it is church embroidery or sewage farming. Good work, well done. That is the definition of Christian work. God is calling you to do your work, whatever it is, 
well. When good work is well done, God is glorified, period. Part of the time that I was working on this sermon, I was sitting in a coffee shop. And since I was working on this, I was especially mindful of how the two baristas were doing their work. I got the sense that they both really enjoyed what they were doing, that they found it fulfilling. And I was amazed by the fact that they knew everyone just about who walked through the door. It was clear they had regular customers and they asked about their kids or their pets and what was going on in their lives. One of the women who worked was excited to tell me all about the different drinks that they could make and gave me a wonderful recommendation. As I was watching this, and then watching the way that these two women worked behind the coffee bar, how they swirled all the ingredients together, I thought, this is beautiful. God has been glorified through these young women who are using their skills and artistry to make me this drink. This is good work. Well done. Then the next day, I was leading our Thursday Bible study for young women. And I was watching one of the women read scripture while seamlessly holding up her new baby. She was holding this child, and I don't know how she was doing, somehow managing to feed the baby, pat the baby on the back, and have a Bible and a pencil going. I, I don't understand how it was possible. But I thought, this is beautiful. This is good work. Well done. And then later on in the day, I got on Instagram and I saw something that my sister had written. My sister now works writing uh, marketing materials for an ice cream company. And I saw the way that she had described an ice cream flavor on an Instagram caption. And I could see the heart that had gone into it because I know her well. And I could see how she had brought all of herself to something as simple as talking about ice cream. And I thought, this is beautiful. This is good work. Well done. Whatever it is that you do, whether your work is something that gives you a paycheck, whether your work is something that hardly anyone sees, whether your work is something that happens in the midst of your retirement or happens from home, your call is to do that good work well, and to do it in the service of God. I want to invite you to imagine something. As you are finishing your day, I know you might not feel that the work that you've done has had any real meaning. You might feel frustrated by the things that you know are still left undone. I want you to imagine when you come to the end of your day, when you come to the end of your work, taking that and lifting it up to God. Here in worship, when we gather together our offerings and gifts, a pastor always stands before the altar and lifts it up to God. That's what I want you to imagine doing with your work. Bring to God all that you have done and all that you've left undone and believe that if it is given as a gift to God, and if it is good work, well done, that God will honor that gift, that God in God's infinite mercy and beauty will be able to transform this piece of work into something even with eternal significance. Your work matters and you will find God in the midst of your work, if you only have eyes to see. Would you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we thank you for the privilege of being co-creators with you. 
We thank you for the privilege of getting to do good work well in your world. God, help us to see the work that we do as meaningful and as an offering to you. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you go from this place, remember that you have a call to do your good work well. And as you go, may the spirit of the living God made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord go before you to show you the way, go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own, go above you to watch over you and protect you, go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand, go beside you to be your companion, and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace.